Ah yes, the snowshoe hare. This animal has developed a specific set of strategies to survive the harshness of winter. Everyone knows it changes its fur from brown to white to blend in, but did you know it also eats its own poop and jeez louise! Hi world, I'm Gordy, and today on Frick I Love Nature, we're gonna find out some cool ways on how nature survives the winter. One of the ways that nature preps for the big chill is by not even staying for the big chill at all. That's right, baby, we're talking about migration. Most of us know that the monarch butterfly and the Canadian goose fly south for the winter, but what other species are willing to take that risk? Billions of species, that's how many. One of the hardest working species is the arctic tern. They literally fly across the world, make some babies, and then they fly back again to escape the winter. In their lifetime, some arctic terns will travel close to like 2 million kilometers. That's the equivalent to them flying to the moon and back, twice, and then dying on their way back again. I mean, what up with that? Sure, dying in space is cool, but you know what's even cooler? The peregrine falcon. I met up with a modern day falconer, Steve, to learn some awesome facts about these birds and how they migrate for the winter. If a peregrine falcon was to dive bomb my head, would I die? It wouldn't go well for you, let's put it that way. Oh yeah? How so? <laughs> it would hurt and it would probably knock you out. These guys can travel over 300 kilometers per hour in a dive when they're hunting. Do they have anything to like, protect themselves from like the weather or anything around that? Just like to them when they're diving? They do have a few adaptations that, that help them uh, to be able to travel that fast without sustaining injury. They have a protective membrane that they can close over their eyes to protect their eyes. Uh, they have special baffles in their nostrils that allow them to regulate airflow so their lungs don't explode when they're traveling that quickly. Yeah, a few different things. And well, since we're here for the main event of the, uh, about migration, I was just wondering uh, like, how far do they usually travel? Like, How far does this guy travel to get to where he needs to go to migrate? Well, if this guy was born here in southern Alberta, he would likely migrate to Mexico for the winter. So he's going to travel 2,000 kilometers to, to where he's going to spend his time on his wintering grounds and do the same thing heading back in the spring. But there are some really interesting cases of odd migrations where they've gotten lost along the way. And there are a few incidents of peregrines trying to cross a big, big ocean and ending up running out of gas and having to land on a ship. And they have so, so little energy to continue their migration that they're sort of at the mercy of where the ship goes. And we've had peregrines from North America end up in Europe, uh, in Asia, uh, Africa. Very, very rare, but it does happen once in a while that they get wayward on their migration. Well, some birds and insects, they like to fly halfway around the world to escape the winter. Other species, they like to stay a little bit closer to home. Hibernators spend their winter in cozy dens, warm caves, or pretty much anywhere out of harm's way. One of the most extreme hibernators is the wood frog. When temperatures start to dip, it will literally freeze solid for the duration of the winter. To stay alive while frozen, they mix urine and glucose into their bloodstream, which creates a natural antifreeze. This prevents their cells from being dehydrated by the ice forming on their bodies. During this time, two thirds of their bodies are completely frozen. When it starts to get toasty out again, they unfreeze, stretch their glutes, and adventure out into the world to make some babies. Also, we've been lied to our entire lives about some of the most famous hibernators. That's right, bears. First off, they don't even hibernate. They go into a state called torpor, which is like hibernation, but way less intense. In hibernation, animals are out cold, whereas in torpor, they'll wake up now and again to groom themselves or have a quick snack or, you know, do other bear stuff. Bear fake news number two, they rarely hibernate in caves. Most of the time, they dig deep dens a few meters into the ground, plug their butt butts with a fecal plug, and close their eyes for the big winter nap. That said, a completely different member of the animal kingdom, the daddy longlegs, aka the harvestmen, actually do spend their winter in caves. Once I tested out my hibernaculum, I decided to explore some caves of my own with my humble cave guide, Ryan. About these harvestmen spiders, uh, so why do they come into the caves uh, in winter? So first of all, they're actually not spiders. Just because something's an arachnid and has eight creepy legs doesn't mean they're a spider. So things like 
mites and ticks and scorpions, they're arachnids as well, but they all fall under a different order. So in the case of daddy long legs, that order is called opiliones. All right, cool. So where do these spiders hang out? They're not spiders. And they're actually right above us. Wow. Looks like a big old piece of burnt toast. These opiliones come down here to avoid the winter cold. The cave temperature is five degrees Celsius year round. If they're down here all of the winter, like, I mean, I get pretty hungry sometimes. What are these guys eating? They can eat a lot of things, actually. So bits of fecal matter, bits of fungus, plant material, small insects. It's actually a great place for them to live. So they eat poop for winter. True fact. You heard here, folks. Daddy like poopies. <laughs> Not all things in nature are lucky enough to eat poo fungus and hang in a warm den all winter. Sometimes you have to adapt to survive. <laughs> One of the most adaptable of our nature friends is moss. And it's so adaptable because it does this cool thing called desiccation tolerance. If you were to dry out normal plants, they would die. But with desiccation tolerance, it allows the mosses that have this quality to completely dry out for long periods of time and come back to life when water. Another amazing fact, like the wood frog, moss creates its own antifreeze during the winter to protect its cells from being damaged by the cold. I wanted to learn more about this cool trait, so I met up with renowned moss junkie, Dr. Renee Belland. I don't know if you've ever done this experiment, but it's a really cool one. You get a thermometer and you get uh, a bowl of water, a big jar of, of water, and you add a bunch of ice into it, put water into it, and then find some salt or some sugar and add it in and stir it in. And just keep adding and dissolving that salt into the water. And you'll see that the temperature of the water will become much less than zero. It'll, you could hit minus 10. So imagine in a moss cell, you've got water. Well, add sugar to it and you'll lower the freezing point of that water, it becomes super cold. And, but as long as it's not frozen, it won't damage the cell. Cool, eh? Yeah, well, isn't that like cryogenics in a way? Uh, in, well, I guess it is in, in a way, yeah. Once I learned the secret to everlasting life, I finally had some time to learn more about our friend, the snowshoe hare. Well, it turns out that most of our furry friends can avoid predators by using their surroundings to blend in or using their huge hind legs like snowshoes to float atop the snow. When food is limited, not only will they eat their own poo nuggets, but they'll eat bark, twigs, and their dead snowshoe friends to survive. Harsh. So how does nature prep for winter? It turns out a surprising amount of animals eat their own poo for nutrition. We also learned that nature has its own antifreeze, which both plants and animals use to survive. And we learned that animals of all kinds travel across the world to make babies and to avoid the cold. It truly is incredible how much effort goes into escaping the winter. Toodles!